Hey guys, Woodruff here. So last but not least, we're going to talk about, when it comes to GI at least, uh, GU will be coming to you soon. Um, we're going to talk about gallbladder problems or um, the difference between inflammation of the gallbladder and gallbladder stones. Um, so I know you guys love when there's long complicated words for things um, and that's what you get with gallbladder problems. So there's what's, oh, of course my cat coming in. Um, there is terminology here. Um, when I say Coley problems, anytime you see the word Coley, C-H-O-L-E, you should think gallbladder issues. Um, we have two issues that we're going to discuss with gallbladder problems. One is cholelithiasis. Those are stones in the gallbladder. And the other is cholecystitis. And that's inflammation of the gallbladder itself. Um, usually these occur together. So they're not necessarily separate things. Usually if a patient has stones, it's going to create inflammation. Um, but it is possible to have stones without inflammation. Um, so yeah, uh, we call them, uh, in cholelithiasis, which is again, those stones, it usually happens because there's some sort of imbalance of materials in the gallbladder where you have too much of one material. So then these stones form. Um, you don't have to know in depth about when we talk about kidney stones, you need to know about the different types, but you don't have to get too crazy with about, uh, with it for um, gallbladder stones. Um, risk factors, I always think of, and this is someone else that I stole, someone else's thing they've came up with, but it's the four Fs um, are the risk factors. So it's people that are in their 40s. Um, fat, fertile, and female. And I don't mean any of that offensively. It's just a way to remember it. Um, and so um, anyone who's obese, um, over 40, fertile. And so you're thinking of like, there's hormonal factors that are related. And then being a female puts you at increased risk for gallstones. Um, other things are going to be a sedentary lifestyle or family history. Um, whereas cholecystitis, usually the most common cause of that is going to be the stones. Um, other things that can put you at risk are going to be fasting. Um, when your GI is less active, you're going to be burning more fat and more fat overwhelms. Um, and creates more materials um, that can lead to stones. So that's why you're more at risk when you're fasting. Um, and then prolonged parenteral nutrition. Um, so having, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, having the, again, kind of the fasting state and stuff like that or altered nutrition. And then diabetes can also put you more at risk for cholecystitis. Because diabetes makes everything harder. Um, so, uh, with people with gallbladder issues, they can have no symptoms, but usually if they have stones or cholelithiasis, what we're going to see is what's called biliary colic. Um, and, um, what this is, is that there's spasms that can end up happening in the gallbladder. Um, so biliary colic, we talked about colic with other GI disorders, um, but, um, you know, normally colic is something that kind of comes and goes, um, but with biliary colic, it's like a intense, severe, continuous pain. Um, they also usually have tachycardia and sweating, and they're usually going to experience this after they have a high fat meal or when they're lying down. Um, another thing you're going to maybe notice with a patient with the gallstone issues is, is that they could have dark amber or brown urine. And that's, um, from, a, the stone creating an obstruction that leads to bile, um, kind of getting sequestered or put away where, um, then your urine and stools, um, you know, can change color as a result of that, um, because they don't have the ingredients they need to make them the color they normally are. Um, because the bile's not there, it's obstructed. On the other hand, so that's stones with cholecystitis. So this is an inflammation of the whole gallbladder. Um, they're going to have more um, systemic issues where they have like severe pain. It's usually going to be in the right upper quadrant. Um, that pain can radiate to the right shoulder as well. They're going to have um, usually systemic signs of infection, inflammation, like fever and chills. They can have jaundice, um, nausea, vomiting as well. Um, overall, when assess for pain, fluid and electrolyte imbalances, um, assess their diet or anything that might be a risk factor, and then any other signs and symptoms like the fever, nausea, vomiting. Um, so I know that the problem's getting better if they have less pain or other symptoms, um, or it's worse if they're having increasing pain or increasing, of course, in other symptoms, like a worse or a new fever um, or signs of an acute abdomen. Remember, there's the pain, perforation, peritonitis, the three Ps, um, and then we want to look for those three hallmark signs, which is the absent bowel sounds, 
um, rigid abdomen and rebound tenderness as those warning signs. Um, diagnostic studies we're going to do, usually we can do an ultrasound. When we're trying to look at individual organs, an ultrasound is usually best. Um, sometimes we can do what's called an ERCP, which is an endoscopic procedure, and we can actually diagnose or treat some of the gallbladder problems this way. Um, we're going to look for infection, like an increased white blood cell count. Um, look for how the liver is being affected. Check that AST, ALT. Um, and then we might look for that um, bile obstruction. So checking those bilirubin levels. So overall, the treatment is we want to get rid of the stones because uh, it's creating, um, you know, where it's like an obstruction um, or get rid of the gallbladder irritation um, and inflammation. So it just depends on what the issue is. If the issue is stones, um, there's things like bile acids that can help to dissolve stones. Um, we can do what's called a lithotripsy. And we'll talk about this more when we talk about kidney stones, um, but it's where we can um, actually get rid of um, the excess stones by breaking them down. Um, we can also give, um, let me see, I'm just kind of looking through it because there's a variety of stuff. Those are the two main treatments for the actual stones. Let me, I'll back up because there's other things that kind of treat symptoms with this. So to treat stones, we can do bile acids or break up the stones. Um, for and the full inflammation of the gallbladder or cholecystitis, we usually do a cholecystectomy. It's a golden standard. Just take the gallbladder out. Um, and, um, uh, you know, with that, they usually need antibiotics pre and post-op. Um, and, um, especially if there's already an infection present, we're going to, for both of these, we want to support good hydration and nutrition. They can have issues with not having all of the vitamins that they need. So usually we want to, um, replace A, D, E, and K, um, uh, especially post-operatively. Um, we want to monitor for the bile obstruction by looking at their stool, their urine closely and any changes there, monitoring the intake and output, making sure they're not getting dehydrated. Um, and they also can have what's called a T-tube and a T-tube is like a, um, a biliary drain or it's a gallbladder drain. So anytime you have a patient with a T-tube, they have some sort of gallbladder problem going on. So we want to make sure that that's draining appropriately. There's also symptoms that can go on for both of these that we can help to manage. Of course, pain and nausea. Um, they can, we can give anticholinergics for spasms. They may need an NG tube. It can help just especially if they have cholecystitis and they're having nausea, vomiting, it can help with decompression. And then um, there's also this medication called um, cholestriamine. Oh, maybe I said that right. We'll see. You'll never know because I'll never know. Um, but um, it's a medication that helps to decrease itching. It binds to some of the um, stuff that's building up that's causing them to itch, you know, the waste products that are building up. Um, but the only thing is, since this is a binding medication, it can also bind with other meds. So we usually like to give it uh, by itself, not with other meds. Excuse me. Got a little crazy here. All right, let's do a practice question. A nurse is providing discharge teaching to a client with acute cholecystitis who's recovering from a cholecystectomy. What statement if made by the client would indicate more teaching is needed? So the first one is, I will need to follow a low-fat diet for the rest of my life. Hmm. I know that we want them on a low-fat diet and we don't want them to have a lot of stuff, but, you know, we always want to stay away from extremes the rest of my life. You know, there are some stuff like pernicious anemia, vitamin B12, they have to have that the rest of their life. Seems a little extreme. So that's the one I'm, you know, so far I've only seen one. <laughs> we'll keep going, but I don't like that it says for the rest of my life because I don't know that they need to be on that diet for the rest of their life. Um, I should let my doctor know if I get a fever after I get home. Well, that makes sense. I think I always want to teach anyone who's had any sort of surgery, you know, um, if you develop a fever, signs of uh, signs, symptoms of infection to let us know. Um, I should avoid any heavy lifting for a few months. Um, that seems to make sense um, because, um, you know, we definitely don't want them. Um, what do you call it? Um, we definitely don't want them. Uh, straining at their sutures or, you know, especially with abdominal surgeries, we don't want too much pressure. So I would think that would make sense. Um, I should avoid any fad diets and rapid weight loss. Hmm. So, you know, even though I, I think that weight loss could help some of these patients, cause that is a risk factor. I do think we do want to always avoid fad diets and we don't want like the word rapid is really extreme. So I think that actually is something we would want to avoid because we don't want, we like gradual weight loss, not rapid. So that leaves B, C, and D as probably being the most correct. So a would be the only sign that they need more teaching because while well, they do need to eat smaller, more frequent meals, high in fiber, calcium, 
Um, we want to avoid excessive fat intake long term. They don't have to necessarily never eat, um, you know, fatty foods and stuff again. Um, some patients that have their gallbladder removed um, do have issues with dumping syndrome and stuff like that. And they can have that shorter long term. It just kind of varies. Um, but um, we should always just kind of look and see what the patient tolerates. We don't want anything excessive, especially in the beginning, but they don't necessarily have to be on a low fat diet their entire life. Um, like we talked about, again, we want them to lose weight if indicated, but not rapidly. I'm going backing up a little bit um, because that's the education. Postoperatively, as the nurse, what I'm going to be doing to manage this patient, they can have a lot of pain postoperatively. This is a laparoscopic procedure usually. And so when they do laparoscopic procedures in order to see well, they have to kind of inflate the abdomen and they inflate it with CO2. And so as a result of that, um, they can have shoulder pain, breathing difficulties, things like that. And they're going to, you know, have like a lot of gas and stuff built up. So placing them in a left, what's called Sims position, it's the left side with the right knee flexed. Um, it can help them to feel more comfortable. Um, and then getting them up and getting a movie, uh, moving early ambulation is so key with these patients. Like GI patients never really want to move because it hurts to move, but it's so key to move for these patients. Um, I'm going to monitor their ventilation, respiratory status, make sure they're doing their incentive spirometer. If they have that T tube or their gallbladder drain, I'm going to monitor that, watch the drainage. Um, they can return to work in one week. Um, but they need to avoid heavy lifting for four to six weeks, um, notify of any signs and symptoms of infection, and um, they can remove their ba bandages and shower the day after surgery. All right, I think that is it for gallbladder problems. Hopefully that made sense. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys for GU next. See you around.